Museum here. Welcome to Night Skies at Home. Here we are on a really lovely evening here in southeastern Pennsylvania. And tonight we're going to have a great time talking about some really, really great topics in astronomy that everybody loves to talk about. The two topics we're going to talk about tonight are black holes and telescopes. So this program that we're doing this evening, this is a regular series of programs that we've been doing for quite some time now. This is program number six. It always happens on Thursday evening at 745. And of course, you can sometimes see us in the background fooling around with some little technical issues that we're trying to get cleared up. You know, working from home, you know, it's a new way of doing things. And, uh, you know, we're working with the equipment that we have to make sure we can bring this program to you. And sometimes it requires us to just sort of fiddle around to tune things up. So everything will be working right for you. We finally got it all set. I was working with my producer over here, Linda. Say hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. My producer who's handling things in the background for us. Uh, so she's going to be a great help this evening. And of course, this evening, we're taking your questions. So we want questions from you, particularly about black holes and about telescopes. So please bring us your questions. We'll take whatever questions they, there are. And also, whatever other questions you might have about astronomy or space exploration, we'll talk about that too. So please send us your questions. Now, I want you to send them, uh, send them right to us through the Facebook page, and we'll get them on to the chat and over to me so that I can work with them. And, and I will be able to answer your questions without too much difficulty. I'd like to welcome our friends from Pennsylvania Tourism, from PA Tourism. We are actually streaming this broadcast tonight on the PA Tourism Facebook page. So anybody that's listening over on the PA Tourism Facebook page, welcome to Night Skies at Home. This guide is going to work for you too, because the skies as I describe them here will also work well for you where you are. Now you might say, well, how can this work if this is coming from a center city environment and I live out someplace where the skies are a lot darker? That's okay. This will work just fine for you without any problem at all. In fact, you'll be able to see a bit more. So I'll add a few things just for you so that you can get a look at some really cool things in the sky. This is a really wonderful time to be looking at the sky. Why? It's springtime. We can get outside and enjoy the warmer temperatures. Now, during this period of quarantine, you might think that that's a challenge, but actually you can actually do this from wherever you are. You can do this right on your front steps, right on your front porch, or you can do it right in your own backyard. That works just great. You don't have to go very far to make this work because all of the objects that we're talking about here tonight are objects that are easily visible, easily visible right from where you are. Center city, downtown, out in the country, wherever, these objects will be easily visible. And the skills that we'll pick up are also applicable any place any place in the world, really, they're applicable. So I want you to make sure that you grab hold of these and you make use of these because what's going to happen is this is going to make you one of the uh, expert sky observers in your location. Okay, so again, welcome to our friends from PA Tourism. And uh, we're going to get started with our content here this evening. And remember, I said the questions I'm looking for are about black holes and telescopes. Anything else, we'll take that too, but we want to do those things so we make sure that you're the expert in your neighborhood of black, about black holes, and if you want to buy a telescope, you know exactly what to do to get the telescope that's right for you. So let's get started with some questions first. I know we have some questions, and Linda's going to throw me the questions, and I'll try to answer them. How close is the nearest black hole to our solar system? Ha ha ha! Boy, what a timely question this one is. How close is the nearest black hole to our solar system? Well, guess what? There was a report released just yesterday from European Southern Observatory about a black hole that's been discovered in a constellation called Triangulum. Triangulum is a Southern Hemisphere constellation. That means we have to go down to South America to see it. And there are a pair of stars down there in the constellation Triangulum that astronomers have been observing because it seems as if these two stars have some very unusual movements. They are not moving in ways that would make sense. So this pair of stars are what are called a binary pair. That means two stars together. And when two stars are near each other, they should orbit each other in a very, very highly prescribed way. In fact, this is so prescribed that astronomers can figure out exactly how long the two stars will take to orbit a common center of rotation that's often found between the two stars. Well, as it turns out, 
these two stars are orbiting in a very odd way. It seems as if there's one star that has a very odd motion, and then the other star is orbiting around that one, sort of like this. Now, if a star is moving this, astronomers should be able to see the reason why it's moving. They should see something else nearby that's affecting it to cause it to move, and they can't see anything. But because of the motion, they can calculate how heavy or how massive the object is. And as it turns out, it seems to be so massive that it's affecting both this star and the other one going around it. Well, something that massive has to be visible, right? No, it doesn't have to be if it's a black hole. And that's the situation we have here. Now, the question was, how far away is this? Well, in astronomical terms, it's right nearby. It's like right over my shoulder here. How far away, actually? 1,000 light years away. 1,000 light years. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it isn't really. The next closest spiral galaxy to us, the spiral galaxy, closest spiral that's like us, that's 2.9 million light years away. Well, how about another galaxy? Well, there's some irregular galaxies, odd-shaped galaxies in the Southern Hemisphere called the Magellanic Clouds. Those are 170,000 light years away. So 1,000 light years is relatively close. But let's put it in other terms. We're seeing that star today. If we go out and look tonight, we see that star today as it looked 1,000 years ago. So it takes light from that object a thousand years to get here at the speed of light. So that's pretty far away in one sense, but pretty close in another sense, okay? So that's the star. It's in triangulum. It's a thousand light years away. We have no need to worry about any of the effects of this object because, first of all, in order for it to actually be uh, to affect us, it would have to be really, really, really close. How close? Well, tens, uh, hundreds of miles away. We could be within 100, within say maybe uh, 100 to 1,000 miles of this object and still not really feel much effect. But once we get close enough to it, it would start to really pull material uh, from this solar system into that, into that object. So perhaps a few thousand miles. Let's not get too close in, in any case. So we don't have to worry. A thousand light years is far enough away for us not to be concerned. All right, so that's pretty good. Next question. What happens when something goes into a black hole? <laughs> what happens when something goes into a black hole? This is probably one of the most asked questions we ever get in astronomy. And the reason why is because the effects of what happened at a black hole are so bizarre, so unusual, so weird. But here's what happens if you get close to a black hole. As you begin to approach the black hole, if you are the traveler heading toward the black hole, guess what? Time seems to move at a regular pace. It doesn't seem to change for you at all. But for an observer, the closer you get, the slower time seems to pass. Now, it's sort of hard to get that together in your brain. So think of it like this. If we had two clocks, one on the spacecraft that's approaching the black hole and one a good distance away, and they're synchronized, what would happen is, as the spaceship clock gets closer, it would seem as if time was slowing down. But actually, on board the spacecraft, for the travelers, it would seem as if time was progressing just as it or ordinarily would. <clears throat> so this is because of the gravitational time distortion that happens, okay? So it's kind of a challenge to understand how all this stuff works. But here's the other part of it. As you get closer and closer to the black hole, once you get to the point of no return to the black hole, guess what happens? After you pass that point of no return, your spacecraft and you would stretch out in a very long, thin line. So you would be pulled, stretched like taffy into a long, thin line and your leading edge would head down into the black hole or towards the interior, while your back end might still be sitting up on the edge of the black hole. And the process that happens here is called spaghettification. Spaghettification, like spaghetti, you'd be spaghettified, and that is stretched out into a very long, thin string. 
But this is superseded by something else very, very important. And that is the intense gravitational pull and the intense tidal forces between the black hole itself and the exterior ring. You would be absolutely crushed by the intense pressures of the tidal forces stretching you apart. So you couldn't exist on the edge of a black hole. You couldn't travel into a black hole and survive. So you'd have some serious problems there. So if you're thinking of heading to a black, to black hole anytime soon, forget it, don't bother going, it's not worth it. It's better to have a look at an image that might show you what that looks like. So let's do this. I'm gonna move some stuff around here and I'm gonna ask my producer if she will just pass my laptop right over to me here. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna share my screen. Hi, we're up close and personal now, aren't we? Ooh, hey there. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna share my screen and we're gonna go out and we're gonna take a look at some black hole stuff because I want you to really see what this looks like, okay? So let me get my screen shared here. We're all out here and we're gonna go right down here. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at this image of what a black hole looks like. I'm gonna blow this up so it's full screen. There we go. Now, hopefully you can see this. I'm just gonna shrink this out of the way like this. There we go. Ah, oh, what a spectacular image we have here. This is really, really cool. This is an artist's rendition of what a black hole might look like. And I bring this up because I want you to see all the parts and pieces and you'll better understand how this works. Now, we've, we only have one actual image of a black hole just taken last April, just released last April, 2019. And it sort of does look very much like this, but here are the parts that are important. First of all, out here, you see this disc out here called the accretion disc. The accretion disk is a ring of material surrounding the black hole itself, where material pulled from some object nearby might be sucked into the black hole. All of that material first falls onto the accretion disk and spins around. As it spins around, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, which is why you see some, to some degree, this bright orange that you see around the edge here, that's meant to depict two things. It's meant to depict heat, and it's also meant to depict how things appear to us at a black hole as it's rotating. Objects at a black hole, or this disk as it rotates, as the material comes towards us, it's brighter in color, and as it rotates away from us, it's slightly dimmer in color. So you see down here, it's dimmer than it is around over here. Now, this edge that you see right up here, whoops, let's get rid of that, I don't need to draw that, but right around here, right along the edge right here, that's called the event horizon. Now the event horizon is an important barrier and it's an important boundary, I should say, because once you pass the event horizon, you can never come back out again. Never, ever, ever. In fact, nothing ever escapes the event horizon. And the reason why that happens is because deep down inside, at the very center of what looks like a black sphere, is the singularity itself. And the singularity is what's causing all this. It is an infinitesimally small, very, very high mass object. It's eight o'clock. Thank you very much. We didn't need to know that. But because of that singularity that has such a high gravitational pull, nothing can escape not even light can escape. And that's the reason why a black hole is black. It's not black because it's deep. It's black because the gravity that is generated by the singularity won't allow anything else to escape. Now, finally, you see in this image what's called a relativistic jet. And that's this jet that you see right here. Well, what actually happens is that as this material spins around the event horizon and around the singularity, this material is heated to incredibly high temperatures. The temperatures get so high that the material itself actually is transformed into energy and is radiated away as X-rays. And occasionally, jets of material shoot off from the rotational poles of this singularity, just like what you see here. Now, this brings us to a very, very important 
important question that I've been asked for about two or three weeks in a row. What's the question? The question is, what is Hawking radiation? Now that we have this background, we can begin to understand what Hawking radiation is. Well, here's what it turns out to be. Einstein actually proposed the idea that black holes could exist, but he didn't finish out the mathematics for that. Another scientist finished out the mathematics that defined exactly how this could come into existence. What also happened was that in 1974, Stephen Hawking, using uh, uh, quantum theory, figured out that black holes actually release a little tiny bit of energy. With the gravitational pull that happens from the singularity, nothing is supposed to escape. Well, he figured out in his understanding of how quantum mechanics work that actually there is a tiny little bit of temperature, a little bit of heat that sneaks out of this black hole right at the event horizon. The event horizon releases this. So in other words, guess what? Black holes leak. Yes, they leak. And that tiny little leak of thermal energy is referred to as Hawking radiation. Now it's very, very low temperature, extremely low temperature, because as it turns out, black holes are really, 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 really cold. Okay, so what happens when that material, that little bit of temperature leaks out? It means that the black hole is evaporating. So black holes actually evaporate. That little leakage of thermal temperature, that little leak of heat, will cause the black hole to shrink and evaporate and eventually disappear. Now wait, what's eventually? Huh. Well, it's a really long time. So if there were a black hole the size of our sun, it would take it billions, billions of years to evaporate. If you had a gigantic black hole, like the supermassive black hole at a core of a galaxy or something like that, it would take tens of billions of years. Now, let's just think about that tens of billions of years. Well, the age of the universe as we see it right now from where we are, the universe is only 13 billion years. So that's not even a 10 and a half of a billion of billions of years. You know what I mean? So tens of billions of years for black holes to evaporate. Okay, so now how does this all get started anyway? Well, the way it actually all gets started is that stars, in space, actually, let's just come back here. There we go, We're right back to here. Stars are gravitational objects that actually get their energy from the creation or the fusion process that happens at their cores. So hydrogen nuclei squishing together at the core generate energy. When they release that energy, uh, or as the hydrogen nuclei combine, they turn into helium, the next element up the periodic chain of elements. A little bit of that mass goes away as energy and the chain reaction of billions of tons of hydrogen being consumed per second generates the heat that's necessary to create the light and heat we see coming from stars. Now, what happens though is when the hydrogen energy, when the supply of hydrogen burns out at the core and the next Next higher energies, uh, higher elements are consumed and burned up. There's no longer the explosive energy to hold the upper envelope of, of gases of the star in a perfect sphere like we might see our sun or any other stars. Well, if that energy goes away, the intense weight of all of those gases of this star, maybe a million miles or more in there, it collapses onto the core and causes a big explosion. Well, if the star is big enough, when that explosion happens, the core shrinks down squeezes out all the protons and the electrons and you end up with what's called a neutron star. Very small, very intense gravity, very high spin rates. If the star is bigger than say four times the mass of our sun, four times the mass of our sun, the neutron star core will also collapse and go into what's called a very, very tiny, 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 tiny object, the singularity that then forms the black hole. So that, that's how black holes form. And if we look around our universe, we find that in our own galaxy, the estimate is there are 
uh, probably 100 million black holes in our galaxy alone, 100 million black holes in our galaxy alone. So there must be some other black holes not too far away from us. We just don't know how far away they are. So, uh, so in any case, when we uh, look around our galaxy, we find these other black holes in places and we realize that, that there are plenty more out there. We don't have to worry about them. No danger for us. Okay, cool, very cool. So uh, what's another question we might have here? Seven-year-old Graham wants to know, are you gonna talk about super black holes? <laughs> sure, Graham, we can talk about super black holes. Super black holes are the kind of black holes that we find at the cores of most galaxies. Astronomers now estimate that almost every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its core. And that means that these are gigantic black holes, hundreds and thousands of times uh, the mass of normal black holes. And so these are black holes that are powering what happens in galaxies. They are consuming stars all the time. They're the energy of the shock waves that are generated when all kinds of activities happen in relation to these supermassive black holes, drives the production of stars. So Astronomers now estimate that there are supermassive black holes at the core of every galaxy. In other words, black holes are actually quite common. Thank goodness they're not so close to us. Okay, what other questions do we have? Can you see black holes with a telescope? Now there's a really good question. Can we see black holes with a telescope? We actually can't see black holes at all. What we can see is the, is the effect that black holes have on other objects around them their intense gravitational pull will cause stars nearby to orbit around them in odd ways. I shouldn't say odd ways, in well-prescribed ways for an object you could see, you should be able to see. But since light can't escape from a black hole, well, that means that we can't actually see the black hole itself. We can only see the effect it has on the space surrounding it. So we might be able to take a photograph that shows us the accretion disk, where we find very, very hot gases, but we actually can't take a photograph of the black hole itself. We can only see how it affects nearby objects. Anything else? What kind of binoculars do you use to stargaze? Well, you know, guess what? The question is, what kind of binoculars do I use to stargaze? Well, I don't use any binoculars to observe black holes, that's for sure. But we do have plenty of other ways in which we can observe Observe, uh, we can observe objects in the night sky. So here's what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to move this guy back over to where it was before, and that'll give me a little bit of room so I can demonstrate what we might be able to use to observe. So uh, my producer, if you would please, you'll give me a little bit more room down here on the tabletop. There we are. Very good. And I can hold up everything we have here. Okay. So, all right. So, wouldn't it be great if we could see black holes in the night sky? It'd be marvelous, but then they wouldn't be black anymore. And this takes us right into observing what we can see in the sky. We can observe what we can see in the sky because light comes from those objects and travels all the way across space and falls in through our atmosphere down to the surface of the earth where our very own one power telescopes, these guys right here, allow us to see what's in the night sky. Normally we use them to look at the moon, all sorts of things like that without too much difficulty. We can see that. So on an evening like tonight, for example, let's just uh, do a quick run through of what we can see with our own telescopes. As you all know, or may be aware, in the evening sky right now, in the Western sky, pretty high up is the planet Venus. Easy to recognize because of its clear, bright white appearance and its steady glow in the sky. Oh, by the way, Here's a trick you can use to tell the difference between stars and planets. Stars twinkle, but planets don't. Remember that, stars twinkle, but planets don't. So if you step outside this evening while the sky is still clear, if you look over toward the west, you'll see Venus high in the western sky. Now, let me just warn you, we only have a couple of weeks of Venus observing left. It is quickly heading back down toward the sun as it orbits around, and we're going to lose it from our evening sky by the end of this month. So if you haven't seen it yet or you want to get a good look at it, I recommend you start looking right now because it's going to start to drop lower and lower in the sky. And it will be gone by 930 by the end of the month. OK, so get out and take a look at it. So that's in the evening. Let's go around to the morning where there are three bright planets still that you can see without too much difficulty. And those planets are Jupiter, Saturn 
and Mars. Now, Mars is beginning to pull away from Jupiter and Saturn. Of course, because it's closer to the sun, it orbits the sun much faster. So it's beginning to increase the distance between the two. What time? Five o'clock in the morning, 5.15. You have to be out in order to see this under a clear sky. Don't go tomorrow morning. Don't go Saturday morning. The weather is not going to be good tomorrow morning and Saturday. Maybe Sunday morning for Mother's Day. Get up early. Take a look at the sky over toward the east, and you'll see these three objects. Now, how can you enhance your view? Well, binoculars really do a lot to help your view of the sky. First of all, back in 1609, Galileo, in 1610, Galileo created a device that helped him make objects appear larger and brighter. We call this device a telescope. And we often say that he is the inventor of the telescope. Well, that's not really true. He didn't invent the telescope. He was really the first one to not only use it for astronomical observing, but also the first one to actually document what he did and write about it in a book to publicize it for everybody throughout Europe to learn about. He was a great salesman. He was a great PR guy. And that's what he did. He really did great public relations on how to use this instrument for observing objects at a distance. Now, I mentioned his telescope because the lens on his telescope back in 1610 was not very big. The lens on his telescope was only about that big, tiny, tiny. But with that, he could see craters on the surface of the moon. He could see Jupiter with its four brightest moons. He could see Saturn, and he could see a feature around Saturn that he couldn't quite interpret. He couldn't figure out what it was. In his notes, he wrote that, appeared, that it appeared as if Saturn had ears. Well, that's kind of an odd thing, but it tells us that his telescope, although kind of good, wasn't all that good. But guess what? You have some equipment at home that will help you resolve this without any difficulty at all. You probably have it and it's binoculars. We talked about these last week. Here's a standard pair of binoculars. Uh, these binoculars are eight power, eight power magnification with 40 degree, 40 millimeter diameter lenses on the front. If I were to use this as a telescope, this would be one, two, about four times the size of the lens that Galileo had on his telescope. In fact, binoculars really are two refracting telescopes side by side. So one telescope over here on this side, the other telescope over here on this side. So the lens on the front gathers light from an object and it creates an image that falls about here in the binoculars. Then the eyepiece back here does the job of magnifying the image that's created. So this is where the actual magnification happens is at the eyepiece. Again, the front lens collects the light, the back lens magnifies the image created. And these are great to use because you have binocular view, they're easy to hold and point at an object, and you can use them for all kinds of other things besides just looking at the night sky. What will you see? Craters, of course, on the moon, no problem whatsoever. And if you take a look at Jupiter, you'll be able to make out those four bright moons that Galileo first saw when he looked at Jupiter for the first time through a telescope. So this is an average pair of home binoculars. These, you, know, you can find these easily for, you know, anywhere from 25 to 50 to 75 bucks, maybe $100 if you go for the real expensive ones. I have here right beside me, though, a pair of astronomical binoculars. Yeah, astronomical because they're astronomically big. I like to use these because they're portable. They have 10 power magnification, but the problem with these is that they're so big, I can't really hold them stable. I need to use a tripod to mount these on to give me a, a stable base for using these. These work really well. The lenses on these are 70 millimeters in diameter, so that's about three inches, okay? And then the magnification on the back end here is about 10 power. So these are 10 by 70 binoculars. You can find these for less than $100 as well. But if you pay a little bit more, maybe 100, 150, you can get really decent binoculars that will work well for you. They're portable, they're lightweight, or uh, lightweight enough to be portable and then usable. But you can use these to hunt comets if you want to. And in fact, many comet discoveries 
discoveries have been made down through history using just binoculars on a section of sky that an observer knows really well. So binoculars are great for this. But you know what? One of the things we wanted to talk about tonight was we wanted to talk about telescopes. And what you need to know in order to find the right telescope for you. So uh, we're gonna ditch the binoculars and we're gonna bring on the telescopes. I happen to have three telescopes here with me. And I'm gonna first bring this guy over. Let me see if I can get this. Here we go. One up here. And I'll bring my other one from here for my tabletop. Here we go. Come right around here like this. There we go. Let's just get that turned right so it doesn't cause too much glare on the lens. So I have two tabletop telescopes here. And these are small ones that work really, really well. And what I'm going to do is, you'll hear that noise. I'm just unscrewing the lens cap here. Almost done. There we are. Okay. Now, actually I actually have one more I'm going to bring in here that I have standing right here. Let me just do a little shifting here. Okay, and my one more I'm going to bring right up here. Okay, so let's start with this guy right over here on this guy on this side. This one right over here. Just uh, take care of that. There we go. Okay, now what I have right over here essentially is a bird spotting scope. Let me just bring this in a little bit closer if I can. This is a bird spotting scope, what's called a spotting scope. It's really just a refracting telescope that has an angular eyepiece on the back end here with a uh, lens right on the front. And you can see the lens right on the front here. There it is right there. And you can see that this is about three inches in diameter, a little bit more than three inches in diameter. This also has a zoom focus on it. It works really nicely. It's waterproof. It's easy to transport and gives really good, clear, crisp views. This is also great for stargazing or for looking at the moon or looking at planets. And as you can see, I have it on a tripod here. And that tripod, of course, gives me the stability I need so I don't have to hold it to try to view. Now, this is not so bad. I think I paid $75 for this piece. So that's not bad. That's a really good price. And it may be the kind of thing that you want to think about uh, if you're considering purchase, purchasing a telescope. Let's move on to these other ones. So you can see what they are. I'm sure you're curious about them because they look really great, don't they? Yeah, they do. Okay. So these are really, really nifty telescopes and really well-built instruments. These telescopes represent the two major classes of telescope types. First of all, there's the refractor telescope over here, which is like the spy glass where you look through the back of the telescope and look straight through. That's what this is, the refracting telescope. And of course, refract refers to the lens on the front. The lens bends or refracts light and sends the light from the object you have it pointed towards down to the back end of the telescope where it comes through the eyepiece. Now in this instrument, there's a mirror right down here set at a 45 degree angle so that light coming into the telescope is then reflected back out through the eyepiece right here on this end. And of course the eyepieces on telescopes like this are interchangeable. And that's a very important part because again, this is where the magnification happens, folks. It doesn't happen at the lens end, it happens here in the eyepiece. This is what you use to gather light from the object you wanna see. When you're thinking about purchasing a telescope, you should think about purchasing the largest lens or mirror you can afford. That's how you should think about it. Never go by magnification. You know, if you can't gather light from an object, you're not gonna see it to be able to magnify it. So as I always say, you can't magnify what you can't see. So don't worry about the magnification. You need the light gathering capability and that's what the lens does. The bigger the lens or mirror, the more light you can gather, the better you'll be able to see dim objects. Telescopes gather light from dim distant objects and they make them appear closer and brighter. That's what telescopes do. That's what the eyepiece is for is to provide the magnification. So this is the refracting telescope. Let's take a look at the reflector. Here's the reflecting telescope here. It works pretty much the same way. The only difference is rather than using a lens, it uses a mirror. Now I'm gonna do something that I probably shouldn't do here. I'm gonna point this just like this so you can 
can look right down in there and you can see where the mirror is. Yeah, I know it's pretty reflective and bright, but you can see there's a mirror down in there. Okay, well, the mirror gathers light from dim objects. And just like the refractor telescope does, the light comes in, hits the mirror, it actually bounces off and comes back up to a little tiny, tiny mirror on the front end right here. There's a little silver dot right there. And then it goes back down and out the eyepiece here. Same thing, down, reflects back up, comes back down, comes out the eyepiece here. And of course, this also has an interchangeable eyepiece so I can change my magnification powers. But again, I want to get the biggest one I can afford, the biggest lens or mirror I can afford. Now, I have these two cool ones because uh, these were actually gifts to me from the company that manufactured them. And so I got these two portable ones that work really well for me on various kinds of uh, observing trips. These are really cool telescopes that work really well. These actually use batteries to run a motor that's in the base of the telescope right here. So if I turn this on and allow it, it will track objects across the sky. Same is true for this one, operates with eight AA batteries. So they work out pretty well. Refractor, reflector. Now, what's the difference, you ask? Well, here's how it goes. Refractors are really great for looking at what are called point sources, like stars or planets or the moon or even something on the surface of the Earth. They work really great for those point sources of light, stars, planets, the moon, things like that. And the images are really very, very good. Reflecting telescopes, generally speaking, are much better for looking at objects that have diffuse light sources, like nebulae or galaxies, clouds of gas and dust in space from which stars are born or what's left after a star explodes, that's a nebula, or a galaxy, that's a collection of stars that often looks like a fuzzy uh, shape in the sky, a very small fuzzy object in the sky reflectors usually are much better at that because they can gather more light. Now, why do they gather more light? Because you can make a reflecting telescope for a much lower cost than you can make a refracting telescope. So where do you get the best value? Well, you get the best value in a reflecting telescope because you can make them larger for the same cost, uh, for a much lower cost. You can make them much larger for a much lower cost than the refractor. These give you much more light gathering for a much lower cost. It's often said, have images. I don't know if I'm ready to make that trade off, but if I need power, this is what I really need. Okay, so I'll use this telescope rather than this one if I'm going for deep sky objects. Now, how can you find out more? about telescopes. Well, it's very simple. I've actually written a little guide for telescopes uh, called Tips for Telescopes. And that is found on the Franklin Institute's website. And in fact, I have a link for that that will be available to you to uh, uh, identify so, so that you can go right to the link and you can get all the information you need to know about buying a telescope. Now, there are a number of places around where you can purchase telescopes. Here in the Delaware Valley, it turns out that there's only one actual telescope store. It's called Skies Unlimited. It's in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And this is operated by a group of folks that are really, really very knowledgeable about how telescopes work. And they can help you figure out what telescope or binoculars might be best for you. You can make your purchases there as well. If you'd like to learn even more about telescopes and see a number of different varieties of telescopes, there's a company that I deal with that works very well called Orion Telescopes. They have a website called telescope.com. I have links to all of these, by the way, available for you as well that you'll be able to pick up from the program. And if you go to their website, not only can you see a huge variety of telescopes, but they also have great tutorials for how to use your telescope and what might be the best telescope for you to purchase. So I highly rec recommend that. They're based in California, but they ship out here really easily. They have a big warehouse here in Pennsylvania. I use a lot of their equipment and I use equipment from Skies Unlimited also. So Skies Unlimited is local. Orion Telescopes is kind of far away, but they ship really easily. So go check out both websites and see what might work well for you. And you'll find the telescope that will work for you. Now, a couple of tips that you need to know about telescopes that are really important. 
First of all, they are not complicated at all. Oh, they can be complicated. They can get complicated, but they're not actually complicated. And you can figure them out and you can work them without any difficulty at all. But you actually have to practice with it in order for you to understand how to use the telescope well. And I'll tell you, just like learning constellations in the sky, once you learn how to do it, you'll never forget how to do it. And you can take your telescope outside and use it anytime. And this summer is gonna be a great time to do that because Jupiter and Saturn are gonna be moving into the evening sky in early July. If you order a telescope now, get your skills together, you'll be ready to show everybody in your neighborhood what Jupiter and Saturn look like in a telescope, as well as lots of other things that you'll be able to see without too much difficulty at all. So remember, you're gonna try and buy the biggest lens or mirror you can afford, and you need practice in order to make it work for you. It's not that difficult. And of course, if you have questions, you can always ask me and I'll be happy to answer them for you and help you figure out how to do it. Okay, great, here we go. So let's get these out of the way here now because I'm sure we have more questions. Let's take some more of your questions. Do you remember your first light with your first telescope? Do I remember first light with my first telescope? Uh, yes, I do remember first light with my first telescope. The telescope actually belonged to my brother and it was a Gilbert, Gilbert Scientific Telescope. If you're old enough, you'll remember the Gilbert Scientific Company. It was a little three inch reflecting telescope and it had the most unstable tripod I could ever imagine seeing. Oh, by the way, that's the other important part of the telescope is the tripod, you really need that. But I remember first light, I remember looking at the moon for the first time. It was truly amazing to see the moon up close under magnification. I'm sure that's one of the things that really sort of cemented my concept that I would end up doing work in astronomy or space exploration when I looked at the moon through that telescope. It wasn't the greatest telescope in the world, but it worked. Here I am today, still working with telescopes. What's next? 10 year old Noel wants to know, do black holes have names? 10 year old Noel, hi Noel. You wanted to know, do black holes have names? No, they don't have names, but they have catalog numbers. And that's the way we actually keep track of a lot of astronomical objects is we give them catalog numbers. So black holes have catalog numbers too. So uh, there are a number of different kinds of catalogs like that. And uh, you know we just give them numbers, and we know where they are based on the uh, based on the constellations where they're found. Can black holes' gravitational pull be measured, and if so, how strong is it? Can the gravitational pull of a black hole be measured, and how strong is it? Olivia, she's eleven. Oh, thanks, Olivia. That's a great question. Uh, so, Olivia, it goes like this: Yes, we can measure the strength of a black hole by looking at how it affects the objects around it. So depending upon how massive an, an object, a nearby object is, uh, its interaction with the gravity of the black hole will determine how it moves in space. And that motion of the object we can see will help us figure out how close that black hole is and how strong it is. So we can look at the core of our galaxy and see how objects in the core of our galaxy behave. And that tells us how, how strong the black hole is at the core of our galaxy. What's next? Well, 10 year old Claire wants to know, when are you gonna talk about sundials? Ah, ha, ha, Claire, thank you very much for that. When am I gonna talk about sundials? Well, Claire, I'm waiting for the weather to be uh, better for us to talk about sundials. They are really cool to use and you can make them very, very easily. And I'm promising that we're gonna make one. Hopefully the weather next Thursday will work out just right and we'll be able to get a sundial made, one that you can make at home. So I'm gonna ask my producer for the next question. If you'll hand me the laptop, there's a couple of other things I wanna show you this evening, and then we'll go from there. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen while I'm uh, taking this question. Is there a flower full moon tonight? Oh, that's a really great question. Thank you for asking that. The question is, is tonight's moon a flower full moon? Well, tonight is the full moon. And we think of tonight's moon as what we call the flower moon. And even though the, 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 we call it the flower moon, it really is more than anything else a reflection of uh, 
how we characterize the different full moons of the different months of the year. So different cultures use different names for the different full moons. This one for this month is the flower moon. And there's a moon name for every month. And they're often very much fun. So one of the things I wanted to show you folks was, if you'll remember, I've talked a little bit about various kinds of apps that you can get that will help you find your way around the sky. And I've spoken about Stellarium as one that I really like. And I've shared my screen with you so that you can see an interesting product that Stellarium has called Stellarium-Web.org. This is their online version of a star map that allows you to see the constellations of the evening sky. So I'm gonna give you a very quick tour of this. I have a link for this that will also be available to you through our chat. So you can find this, but I just wanna show you the parts and pieces of it really quickly so you'll see what its capability is. So first of all, here you can see the stars without any difficulty at all. Down here at the bottom of the screen is the direction indicator for south and the time indicator is right over here in the lower right hand corner. This says 2320 and that means this is 1120 in the evening. It's really not that late. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna change the time. So I clicked on the box and I'm gonna bring this down and I'm gonna make it 21 minutes after eight in the evening. That's what I'm gonna do with that. And I'm gonna set it just like that. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom out so that I can show you a bit more of the sky and I can show you a constellation that's prominent in the sky right now. And it's this one, Leo the lion. This is the main constellation of the spring sky. And Leo is a really cool constellation to know because Leo connects you across to the west, all the way out here to Orion, where we find the star Betelgeuse right up here. And it connects you back to the east to an orange star, another orange star called Arcturus. Now, the cool thing is that both Arcturus and Betelgeuse are both red giant stars. So if you look for the backwards question mark of Leo the lion, there's the backwards question mark, and his back end over here has a triangle that points to the east, you will have found this central constellation of the spring sky. Now, you're outside tonight at this time, looking halfway up the sky, and you can see Leo the lion connect to the west to Orion, connect to the east to Arcturus in the constellation Duodes. Now you can see I have the star outlines there. I can take those away, but I can also bring up the artwork of the stories of the sky. So now you can see that without much difficulty at all. So that's easy to see. And you'll notice that right over here, low on the southeastern sky, it says moon. That's because the moon is gonna be rising over there pretty soon. And I'm gonna do a little trick here just to make that happen a little quicker. I'm gonna advance time so that the moon comes up, there we go. And I've pushed us all the way till nine o'clock. And now you can see that the moon is just rising above the horizon. The flower moon is coming up right there and it's just past full. It's just about a day and a half past full. So it rises a little after the sun sets and it will set tomorrow morning a little after the sun rises. So now if I want to, what I can do with this is I can swing the sky around to the east and then I can zoom in on an object if I want. And I can get much closer. And then if I want information, all I have to do is click on the object. And up in the corner over here, I'll find information about that object. So that's pretty cool. I really like this. Stellarium-web.org. Okay, so I'm going to zoom back out. Let me know if you have a question about this. I'll be happy to answer it. Go ahead, what's the next question? Okay, 10 year old Maggie would like to know how many galaxies have been discovered and how close is the black hole this is here? So, thank you. Uh, how many galaxies are there? How many galaxies have been discovered? And how close is the closest black hole? Well, the closest black hole is only a thousand light years away. That's pretty close, astronomically speaking. Uh, but in terms of uh, anything else, it's still a long ways away. It takes the light from those stars about a thousand years to get here. So that's a long way out. But how many galaxies are there? Oh my gosh, we have been able to easily see 
hundreds of thousands, actually millions of galaxies, tens of millions of galaxies, particularly because Hubble Space Telescope and and other large telescopes have been giving us images of the sky that show us that everywhere we look, everywhere we look, every part of the sky we look into shows us lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of galaxies. But astronomers have also done some additional work. They've used statistical analysis to estimate the number of galaxies in the universe. It's well over a hundred billion billion galaxies in the universe, well over that. In fact, it's so far beyond that, I don't even want to mention what it is because it sounds too fantastic. And besides, I can't count past 100 billion anyway. So 100 billion galaxies, at least in our universe. Okay, so now I'm going to close this web page here, and I'm going to bring you to another one that I found that's really, really great. You know, we've talked for a long time about finding satellites in the sky, like International Space Station, and I found another website that I think you'll find really, really helpful and useful. This one, you'll see the link right up at the top of the page here, james.darpinion.com. And the link again is available in the chat. You'll be able to find it for this particular site. And here's what it does. It shows us three sections of screen. Over here is a list of satellites available over the next five days. The next image you see is looking down on Earth at where you are on the planet and where a satellite might be passing close by you. And then the next screen over shows you where you'll see it in your sky. Well, I'm gonna tell you a little funny story about this. As I was learning about this, I went to the next night. This is 3.15 AM, a.m. tomorrow. And what I noticed at 3.15 a.m. tomorrow is here's International Space Station, but I looked at the house and guess what? It's my neighbor's house. So this, this program uses Google Street View to actually give you the view of where you can see this in your sky, in your neighborhood. I really highly recommend that you grab hold of this. It's just a web page. You can use it anytime. And you, you can use it to find out where satellites are visible relative to you on the planet and how you can see them in, in your sky. It doesn't take anything to use this. It's much easier than a lot of other programs. So I highly recommend you give that a try. Okay, great. Okay, we have just a few minutes left. And in the few minutes left, I just wanna mention just a couple of things that are really important. There there are so many resources for sky observing around Pennsylvania. Our friends over at PA Tourism gave us a list of so many locations there are around the state of state parks where we have clear dark skies. Now you can't get to those clear dark sky locations right now because we're in quarantine, but later this summer when the quarantine breaks and we can actually go out, these are some really great locations around the state that you can go to where you can have a great view of the night sky. You know, we have to think of the night sky as a precious resource that we have to protect. That is, we have to reduce the number or limit the number of night lights that we use for illumination so that we can preserve a beautiful, pristine, dark sky. Now, I'm not saying that we should not use night lighting. We need night lighting, but what we need to do is direct that lighting down toward the ground where it's most useful. Lighting that sprays up into the sky doesn't really help us very much. And these locations are ones in Pennsylvania where we have really, really dark skies. One of the best known locations across the East Coast of the United States, Cherry Springs State Park near Cowdersport, Pennsylvania. This is a great location. You can actually see the Northern Lights from there when conditions are right. And it's just a wonderful location that is set up expressly for the purpose of astronomical observing. Sproul State Forest near Renovo is another one. Over 300,000 acres of stargazing bliss right there at Sproul State Forest. Laurel Hill State Park near Somerset. That's a fabulous location, a state park that has a great view of the night sky. Racetown Lake near Heston is another location that's really wonderful. You can see the stars gleaming off of the dark waters of Racetown Lake. I highly recommend you do that. You have these beautiful skies surrounded by 8,300 acres of clear water. So you get these really great views. Sarah 
Harris Campground near Lake Erie in Erie. You can see a great sunset over the lake and then you can see a beautiful sky with lovely stars there. And finally, down here closer to Philadelphia near Elverson is French Creek State Park, just 45 minutes away. It's a great location for seeing the night sky. So Pennsylvania really has a lot of great locations where you can go out and observe the night sky and use some of the skills that you may have picked up this evening to help you find your way around the sky. You can use those skills to see what a really beautiful sky looks like. So if you uh, go to our website at the Franklin Institute, we have these locations there. So you can check out each and every one of them. I highly, recommend, I highly recommend you go to the website and check out the park website so that you can get all the details about when they're open, when they're closed, things like that. So you'll know when to go out there and view. And again, our friends at uh, PA Tourism have done a really, really great job of helping us out with this. Uh, and so I want to say thank you to them for uh, simulcasting our broadcast tonight on their Facebook page. Again, hi out there to everybody else in Pennsylvania who might be watching our program tonight. Thanks for joining us here on Pennsylvania Tourism, on PA Tourism, and on the Franklin Institute's Facebook page. We're glad you could be here. Next week, we're going to have a guest, uh, my good friend Mark Devlin, who's an astronomer at the University of Pennsylvania, does all kinds of really wonderful research, is going to be with us to talk about the research that he's into. Again, some of the most amazing stuff if you've heard, and we'll talk a little bit about the future of astronomical research as well. So I'm Derek Pitts of the Franklin Institute. I'm here as part of the Pennsylvania Pursue Your Hominess series. Explore it now and visit it later. The PA Pursue Your Hominess series. Explore now, visit later. Again, I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute. Thanks for joining us tonight for our Night Skies at Home program. We'll be back in again and next week, 7.45 p.m., don't forget, you get out and do some obs observing of the night sky so you can make that connection to the cosmos. You'll really enjoy the beauty of the sky, and I think you'll find the calmness that it brings to be welcome as well. Happy observing, folks. Thanks again for being with us. You can reach out to me. I'm Cool Astronomer on Twitter, at Cool Astronomer is the handle, and of course, you can find me at the Franklin Institute at fi.edu. I'm sorry, my email address is dpits at fi.edu. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.